My next book is called Hindu Dharma and the Culture Wars. The um, name Culture Wars perhaps requires some explanation. It originates with the German Chancellor Otto von Bismarck, who um, named Kulturkampf that is to say, culture war, his um, standoff with the Catholic Church in order to wrest control over education. You see, what he had in mind was a strong secular state, which would accept religion somewhat, but um, keep, it, keep it in its place and create loyalty towards the fatherland. Whereas the church thought it was very important to control education of the new generations to make sure that they would be protected against all the secular modern influences and kept in uh, the Christian tradition. Ultimately, it um, ended in what was more a defeat for Bismarck. But so we'll um, leave him there and see what the term in the modern age has come to mean. It mostly refers to American debates between Christianity and modernity. In the case of America, mainly over the big ethical questions, namely um, abortion, euthanasia, gay marriage. And um, in America, these are very dramatic debates with a lot of demonstrations, some people murdered also. Um, like abortion doctors. And um, in India, you have a similar phenomenon, but mostly about different issues. Like, for instance, the abortion issue, so, uh, so much highlighted in America, is hardly an issue in India, because already for decades, population pressure has been so strong that any government just wants to try anything that can help lower the birth rate, including abortion. Now, in Hindu Dharma, traditionally, abortion is considered one of the worst sins. And that is why in 1996, the Vishwa Hindu Parishad and a Hindu organization affiliated with the RSS uh, created a 40-point Hindu agenda, demands from all parties, but principally from the BJP. And one of the 40 points was the uh, prohibition of abortion. Now, that was not considered by any political party because it was too far removed from the national interests. So there was hardly any debate about this. There still isn't. Another point is uh, euthanasia. And there I think there is some good news to report from a Hindu viewpoint. Euthanasia was, or you know, Free, freely chosen death was prohibited by the British in the 19th century from a uh, Christian starting point. Namely, in Christianity, it is considered that only God has a right over life and death, so you should not have a right to choose death yourself. You should not commit suicide 
nor any softer form of control over your own death. It's only God who should have this control. Now that was very much a Christian principle. In Hinduism, you have a tradition of freely chosen death, mostly in the form of fasting unto death. And the idea is not that just anyone can do that, like some young uh, Romeo who is love sick, who is disappointed in love and then decides, you know, life is not worth living anymore and then puts an end to it. That's not the idea. That's also prohibited in Hindu Dharma. However, when you're old and you feel your time is up, then it is accepted to keep the honor to yourself and to fast unto death. Or in the case of very advanced yogis who can freely uh, control their death, you know, that they simply uh, choose to die and then die. Uh, so the secularists, of course, would prefer to forbid that and to stick with the British law that forbids it. In uh, the modern age, there have been some high-profile cases of this fasting unto death, like uh, Vinayak Damodar Savarkar, the uh, Hindu nationalist leader did so in 1965. Uh, the um, Gandhian activist Vinoba Bhave did so in 1982. And when Vinoba Bhave was on his deathbed, he received a visit from the then Prime Minister Indira Gandhi. Now, the secularist press at that time fulminated in editorials that this was not right, he should not receive the visit of the Prime Minister. On the contrary, he should be imprisoned, he should be force-fed because he was trespassing against the law of the land. Now, of course, the, the secularists are always very superficial. In this case, it should be realized that the law of the land was not innocent. It did not fall from the sky. It certainly did not emanate from the will of the people. It was imposed by the British out of Christian prejudice. And so, if, uh, if the native tradition in this regard was restored, that was only right. Now, that has recently happened. You see, a few years ago, there was a case where initially someone who wanted to fast unto death was... Uh, was um, sentenced, was berated by the courts. But then the giants, uh, for whom this is a, a most important issue, went to the Supreme Court and achieved that the Supreme Court uh, suspended this verdict and therefore effectively allowed from now on the uh, free choice to die. So effectively, this fasting unto death is now accepted, is now legal in India. But that's a great victory for native tradition. Similarly, we have the case of um, the prohibition of homosexuality, which also is uh, a consequence of a British imposed law, which again uh, try to uh, put into law a Christian viewpoint uh, because, you see, the British found that the Hindus themselves did not prohibit this. You see, what they saw in India was a sort of policy of what Bill Clinton used to call don't ask, don't tell. You see, there was no publicity, no big talk about uh, sexual variations. But, you know, it was not punished. There was, of course, no stoning like, uh, like in Islam. There was no throwing off high buildings. There was also no imprisonment like happened in, in England itself against Alan Turing, against Oscar Wilde. There was really no prohibition at all. So it was not deemed equal, like nowadays gay activists in America want. 
but it was not forbidden. So, you know, an eye was closed, you know, uh, it was simply accepted without any ado about it. Now that effectively also by a Supreme Court uh, decision has been restored. And so the British uh, law has not formally been abolished, but it is now without effect. So that's how um, these culture wars uh, are dealt with in India, without much ado, without sensation, without drama. Um, but um, the, the correct and progressive thing was done. Now, in the case of um, Bismarck's Kulturkampf, the issue mainly was control over education and over the curriculum. Now that in India is very much prominent, far more than these ethical issues that, that rock America once in a while. About the uh, fight over the curriculum, the, the most uh, prominent visible part is the teaching about history. Now there, there is hardly any culture war going on. In 2002, there was an attempt by Minister Murli Manohar Joshi to rewrite the textbooks, at least the books of history. And more attention was given to the Islamic atrocities against Hinduism during the Middle Ages and um, the questioning of the <coughs> Aryan invasion scenario. Unfortunately, the exercise was very incompetent. It was not done by proper historians or by historians with the necessary titles, but not the necessary knowledge. And so when two years later Congress came to power, they had no problem at all in abolishing those textbooks and bringing in, on the whole, better ones. You see, that were better conceived, better written, but that had the whitewashed version of history that is the hallmark of secularism in India. The present um, BJP government by Narendra Modi has not even made an attempt to change anything at all in the textbooks, contrary to the propaganda that the secularists wage all over the world, where they say this is a Hindu fanatical government, they try to impose the Hindu version of history and so on. They have done no such thing at all. You see, there the culture war has one party totally absent. It is only the other side that cares about culture wars, like uh, you can see it, for example, in state elections, where a few months ago in December 2018, several BJP governments have lost, have been replaced by Congress governments. And the first thing they did was a very clean sweep of all the personnel that had been nominated by the BJP. You see, this is something the BJP itself never does. Uh, it uh, doesn't care about the power that is wielded by administrators and others outside the formal circles of government. When in fact, the, the, the formal circles of government have only limited power, much power is wielded by the administration that remains in place after elections, even after different parties have come to power or at least to office. Um, so very, very much power is uh, exercised outside the corridors of politics. And so politicians can have an influence on that only if they choose to do so. And the BJP doesn't choose to do so. So uh, in that regard, of course, the um, state of affairs at present is that the culture war is permanently being won by one side and is being lost permanently by the other side. And so 
in education, there is no Hindu party. There is, there is a party that simply undergoes whatever the secularists choose to do. And this is part, of course, of a much larger problem, namely the constitutional discriminations against Hinduism, discriminations both in temple management and in education. Uh, one uh, discrimination that uh, certainly catches the imagination is the Right to Education Act, which imposes a large financial burden on Hindu schools, not on minority schools. You see, that is perfectly constitutional. That is part of the existing constitutional discrimination against Hindu schools. So any government in its right mind, it doesn't have to be Hindu minded, it should only be democratically minded, equality minded, would abolish those discriminations. That, unfortunately, the BJP has not done. There has been a private bill by Satya Pal Singh that proposed to abolish these discriminations. It was never taken up by the government. Nothing came of it. So um, that is the state of affairs in the Indian culture war. The Hindu side has not even mobilized to wage that war whereas the other side has been waging it for decades. Thank you.